Hi, welcome to the Physics of MRI Made Easier. This presentation was created by Gary Brom in consultation with Dr. Jaffer for your learning pleasure. Before enlightening you with the physics of MRI, I would first like to mention a few key points in its history. The fundamentals of MRI originated in 1946 when Nobel Prize winners Felix Bloch and Edward Purcell discovered NMR, or nuclear magnetic resonance. NMR is a tool used routinely by chemists even to this very day to study chemical structures using simple one-dimensional techniques. However, it wasn't until almost 30 years later, when in 1973, Paul Lauterbur demonstrated the basic principles of MRI by producing a two-dimensional image of a test tube using NMR. From there, the evolution of MRI took off. In 1975, Richard Ernst made his Nobel Prize winning discovery of rapidly converting signals to images using the basic tools of modern MRI, making the possibilities of MRI limitless. For those math majors, he did this using phase and frequency encoding techniques, and then using Fourier transforms to produce an image. So how does MRI actually work? To get the final image that we see, the patient must first be placed in a large magnet. A radio wave is then sent at the patient, who emits a signal in response. This signal is detected and used for reconstruction via various mathematical equations and transformations to finally produce an image on the screen. Before going into the in-depth physics of MRI, let us first start with some basic physics. As most of you know, we are all made up of atoms. Each atom is made up of protons and electrons. The protons, which have a positive charge, spin about an axis in a similar fashion to that of the Earth. As a proton spins about its axis, it produces an electric current. You may recall that an electric current will produce a magnetic field. In the case of the spinning proton, a magnetic field is produced in the same pattern as that which is produced around a bar magnet. We don't feel the effects of this magnetic field, however, because all the protons are pointing in random directions, and consequently, their magnetic field cancel each other out. However, when these protons are placed in an external magnet, they will align themselves with the magnet like a compass pointing north. In the external magnetic field, the protons will either be pointing in the same direction as the magnet or in the opposite direction. A net charge is created by these protons because more protons will point in the same direction as the magnetic field due to its lower energy level. To picture this, think of walking in the wind. It takes less energy to walk with the wind than to walk against the wind. Unfortunately, it gets a little more complicated. The protons don't simply sit in the magnetic field, but are constantly spinning like a top. This spinning of the proton is known as precession, and if you click the spacebar, you'll see an example of a proton spinning about its axis. We can actually calculate this precession frequency using the Larmor equation. This states that the precession frequency is equal to the magnetic field strength times a constant known as the gyromagnetic ratio. The gyromagnetic ratio is dependent on the material in the magnetic field. It is important to note that the precession speed changes directly with different external magnetic fields. The stronger the magnetic field, the greater the precession speed, and the faster the protons will spin. Before moving on, let's take a step back and recap. When someone is placed inside an MRI machine, they are actually placed inside a giant magnet and surrounded by a magnetic field, which affects the many protons inside of them. These protons will align themselves with the magnetic field. Remember, more protons will align in the same direction as the magnetic field, rather than in the opposite direction. The billions of protons working together will thus produce a significant magnetic force in the same direction as the external magnetic field. Now click the spacebar and you can see for yourself what happens to the protons inside of you as you enter an MRI machine. Now that we have protons lined up, we wish to manipulate them so that we can produce different types of images. We do this by sending a radio wave at them in short bursts. This radio wave must have the same frequency as the protons for the energy to be absorbed. As you may have already guessed, this frequency is calculated using the Larmor equation, which will determine the frequency of the spinning protons.
When the RF pulse and the protons have the same frequency, the protons will pick... When the protons absorb the energy from the radio frequency pulse, two things occur. The first is that some protons will jump to a higher level of energy. When they do this, they now face in the opposite direction of the magnetic field. This will decrease the total magnetic force, as is demonstrated by clicking the space bar, which will cause the RF pulse to hit the protons in the magnetic field. To understand this concept further, we can think of people running on a windy day. Some people will run against the wind, while others will run in the same direction as the wind. Because it takes less energy to run with the wind, more people will choose this option. The RF pulse is like an energy drink. When given to the runners, they gain energy, and consequently, more runners will be able to run against the wind. When hit with the RF pulse, not only do the protons gain energy, but they also begin to spin in phase with one another. This produces a new magnetization plane, known as a transverse plane. The reason this magnetic plane didn't exist before was because all the protons spinning randomly out of phase with one another cancels each other out. To observe this phenomenon, please click the spacebar. So now that we know what happens when the protons are hit by the RF pulse, what happens afterwards? Simply put, the protons will eventually go back to their original state. Over time, they will lose the energy gained and will align themselves back in the same direction as the magnetic field. As well, they will begin to spin out of phase with each other, eventually eliminating the transverse magnetization plane. Looking at this process more closely can give us valuable information, which will become the basis to create different types of images using MRI. We know that after the RF pulse, the protons lose energy and relax back to their original state. However, it should be noted that different substances relax or lose energy at different rates. Therefore, at any given time after the RF pulse, the protons of different substances will have different amounts of energy. This concept is the basis of T1 imaging. To observe an animation of this phenomenon, please hit the spacebar. When the RF pulse is turned off, the protons will also begin to spin out of phase, becoming more and more disorganized and slowly eliminating the transverse magnetization plane. Protons of different substances become disorganized quicker than others. It is this principle that is the basis behind T2 imaging. Once again, please hit the space bar to see an animation of this phenomenon. So now that we know some of the physics behind MRI, let's get on to the images. How do we know which is T1 weighted and which is T2 weighted? To figure this out, let's look at T1 and T2 a little more in depth. T1, as was mentioned before, is based on the time it takes protons to lose its energy or relax. This time depends on tissue composition, structure, and its surroundings. Looking at specific mediums, CSF, as with most fluids, have a long T1, while gray matter, white matter, and fat have shorter T1 times. This means that CSF will take the longest to relax and have the least signal at any given point on a T1 weighted image. It should be noted that T1 depends on the strength of the external magnetic field, so that a stronger magnetic field will give you a longer T1. If you're at all confused, perhaps I can clarify with the following example. Click the spacebar to hit the different protons with an RF pulse. Now click the spacebar again to see what happens when you turn off the RF pulse. After the RF pulse excites the protons, they will relax at different rates. Fat will relax the fastest and CSF the slowest. If we take a snapshot of the protons relaxing, we see that fat will have the greatest signal while CSF will have the lowest signal on a T1-weighted image. So which one is the T1-weighted image? You can click the spacebar to find out. T2 is a measurement of how quickly the protons become out of phase or disorganized. T2 is dependent on the inhomogeneities of the local magnetic field within the tissue. Thus, impure mediums will have a shorter T2 than pure mediums. Using this knowledge, we can figure out that CSF which is a very pure liquid, will have a long T2, while gray and white matter, which are made up of a variety of different cells, will have a shorter T2. Thus, when looking at a T2 weighted image of the brain, CSF should have the greatest signal because it is the most organized at any given time, since it takes the longest to become disorganized. So which image is T2 weighted? Click the spacebar to see the answer. 
There is another little trick to determine if an image is T1 or T2 weighted. If you take a look at the corners of the image, you will often see many numbers and something called a TR and a TE. You can use these numbers to determine if the image is T1 or T2 weighted. This is similar to looking for an L or an R when examining an X-ray of an arm. So what does this TR and TE mean? TR is the time given to the protons to relax after being hit with an RF pulse, while TE is the time given to the protons to become disorganized. Looking at the following chart, we see that T1-weighted images will have a relatively short TE and a relatively short TR. This makes sense if you remember back to T1 imaging being based on proton relaxation. A short TR means that the protons won't have enough time to fully relax, and we can take a snapshot of them during the relaxation process. A short TE means all protons will not have any time to become disorganized. We also see that T2-weighted images have a long TE and a long TR. This also makes sense. A long TE means the protons will be given enough time to become somewhat disorganized, but not fully. While long TR means all protons will have time to fully relax and regain their full energy, or T1 signal. If you are all confused, let's look at a T2-weighted image of the brain. We know it is a T2-weighted image because it has a long TR of 3500 and a long TE of 98.4. Because the TR is higher than that of all the tissues in the brain, they all have fully relaxed at the time this image is taken. The TE, however, is around that of the gray matter, higher than the white matter and a lot less than the CSF. Therefore, all white matter will have become fully disorganized and lost all T2 signal, whereas CSF is the most organized and will produce the most T2 signal. Well, that's all the physics of MRI for this session. Remember, this is the very basic principles of MRI, and by no means the full story. If you enjoyed learning about the physics of MRI, I implore you to read more about it. It only gets more fascinating. The rest of the slideshow is a short quiz to help you explore your knowledge of T1 and T2-weighted imaging, followed by a brief outline of the advantages and disadvantages to MRI.